Hi, Genevieve, how's it going? Good, thank you. Oh my goodness, this is so fun. I'm so glad we're getting some time to talk to each other. Um, You're all the way in South Africa, right? Yeah, in Cape Town, South Africa. Cape Town, South Africa, amazing. Well, I know it's late there, so thank you for taking some time to talk to us. No problem. Why don't we start a little bit by getting to know you, Genevieve. Start off by telling us your full name and how old you are and how egg freezing became part of your life. So I'm Genevieve Bates. I'm 29 years old and I have been in the egg donation industry for eight years. I actually run my own um, international egg donor agency called Traveling Donors and I've got involved in egg donation after I had been an egg donor. Oh, wow. So tell us how old you were when you became an egg donor. So I was 21 years old when I first donated in Cape Town. And then that sort of led me on to doing international egg donations. Um, But my first two experiences weren't very positive. And that's what sort of drove me into the direction to provide a service that was much more uh, boutique and personal for both egg donors and intended parents. Because I sometimes feel that the intended parents get the most attention and the egg donors kind of get neglected. And then they don't want to donate again. So one of my company's belief is if we help the donate don- donate the first time and then she wants to donate again, it means we've done a good job. You know, so if someone wants to continue donating, then they've had a good experience and we're, we're, I'm achieving what I set out to do. Wow. Yeah. So tell us about your egg freezing experience as a donor those first two times, especially when you were 21. What was the yield like? How'd you feel like yes, on the meds? I, yeah, I did it in Cape Town. Um, and I really don't remember feeling any effects of the hormones because I was 21. And I can definitely say donating when you're really young versus trying to stim when you're like even eight years later, it's completely different. Your body's changed significantly. And like the bounce back, you're taking longer to recover. But here in Cape Town, I kind of had three different doctors doing my scans and none of them knew my name when I came in for my consults, which kind of upset me and wasn't very personal. And then the day of my egg retrieval and I came out of, you know, recovery and they gave me my sandwiches and my tea, the nurse came up to me with an envelope and said, there's your check. You can leave when you're ready. And I was like, I never want to do this again. Wow. Yeah. My did first, they, the did, end of my first experience. Did they have an opportunity where you could bank a few eggs for yourself in this cycle or was everything given to the donor family? So the, this was like, we're talking 2011. So it was all just given to the donor family. So egg freezing in South Africa for young women is not very popular. It's only really discussed with women who are going through like chemotherapy or have actual genetic reasons, um, like Turner syndrome. Otherwise, you know, career women are really left on their own devices. Wow. Did yeah. they um, give you an organized protocol list or like things that you should do during so, the freeze you know, or things you shouldn't for, do? For the donor stim, you know, I got my protocol and drugs to follow and the nurse was available. And during the cycle, the support was there. But the minute the eggs were retrieved and I'd been collected, I had no follow-up phone call 48 hours later because I triggered with HCG because back then Ovidrol was still very popular. Unlike now, it's like a taboo with egg donors because of OHS. Nobody got hold of me. I don't remember being sent home with any like post-op instructions. Um, and it was just my boyfriend who was there with me and that was it. I never wow. heard from the clinic again. Wow, so eight years passed and you decided to donate again after all or actually so what happened was at the time um my boyfriend's sister had just donated in cape town as well through a different fertility clinic and she had had a much better experience and we actually retrieved on the same day although we didn't know because i'd only just started dating her boy her brother like three weeks ago and we got chatting and she told me she'd found this company who sent donors to india and she was like come on jen let's do it together i promise you we'll have a better experience and i was like I don't know, maybe think about it. The compensation was much better uh, compared to what you get in South Africa. I mean, South African egg donors only get about $450, which is shocking. That's not even, Uh, no, that's not even, no, that's insane. 450 South African dollars. So so US dollars. Oh, US dollars, what? Yeah. 
I wouldn't I do it. I wouldn't do I it for five hundred dollars. <laughs> I mean, even if we list, if we're doing like the rate of exchange and the cost of living, I still think South African egg donors are being exploited. Wow. I mean, of course, it, you know, um, it doesn't cost as much to live here, but still, yeah. the amount of time and effort and coordination that goes into being available and committed. I no don't way. think that is a fair representation no, absolutely not. of a donor's time. I mean, I understand there's country laws that say like donations should be more altruistic and not, you know, donors should not be coerced into donating because of money. That's the South African stance. And I appreciate that it's different from the US. I mean, I also have my own opinion about what's happening with the open egg donor market on compensation. America is crazy as well. That's like on the other extreme. But I kind of feel like this is on the other side and that it's not fair either. There should be a happy medium where what the donor is doing equally portrays the amount of effort uh, and work. The compensation. I think if a South African egg donor was getting $1,000, it would be a fair remuneration for her time because it's equal to like the income earned in this country. I don't. So well, I kind do of you think. Know what, do you know what egg donors got in the US for donating? The 21 yeah, year olds I work, that. Yeah, I work in the US and I send some of my own personal donors there. I mean, yeah, I know of, that the minimum like, egg donations get 8000 Yeah, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000. And I mean, I think I still believe that's fair and reasonable in relation to cost of living. What I don't agree with at the moment is donors getting 25000 I've even heard an attorney that I'm friends with, she did a contract where a donor got $250,000. This is such a high dollar industry and everybody's profiting except for the people that are being the altruistic ones, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, and then, I know. And then, and then the but, patients but are paying double. Some donors are doing it as a job. Yeah, I like, know it's a job. I know it's a job, it's like <laughs> any other job, but it's also like the, do- the patients um, that need the eggs are overpaying than it, what yes. it needs to be. The patients that are donating to help those families create families are not being compensated for what their DNA is actually worth. And mm-hmm. then the centers are like making all this profit. It's Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you know much agencies. about egg freezing banks. Have you, oh, do you yeah. have any understanding? Well, I have a big thing against egg banking um, because the egg donor, is, I don't think she's fully educated that when she donates an egg bank once, she only gets compensated once. But if she donates 18 mature eggs, those eggs will be split into three batches of six. They'll be sold to three different families, but she only gets compensated once. So tell me, how is them making three times the profit of uh, one compensation one donor. fair? Mm-hmm. Well, it's because they're 21-year-old eggs. And that's the difference, is that it's not 30-year-old eggs where they, it takes 12 eggs to make one baby. The 21 year old yeah. eggs, it takes less eggs because they're younger. Yeah. And you're right, that isn't fair. Uh, but what do you think about, just because we're having this conversation, what are your thoughts about the fertility clinics having their own egg banks? Now, roughly, I would assume they're doing somewhat similar that they're putting eggs mm-hmm. in lots of six and they're selling mm-hmm. them as a batch of six. But right. Um, you're right. The, the patient only gets compensated once, but you could also say it's two weeks of their time and sure. But I also kind of feel like, because you know, someone approached me to set up an egg bank and I said, the only way I would agree to do it is I'd have two rules. One, each egg donor may only donate to us once and two, her batches of eggs may only be split into two. Ah. And she must be compensated an extra thousand dollars once we sell the second batch. Wow. So I think that, yeah, you know, and, and that goes to the patient that donated. Or they should be given the opportunity that part so of their eggs. get six eggs of them for themselves. Yeah, for themselves. Exactly. I totally agree. Because they're doing all this effort. I actually know a really good friend of mine who is a writer in, um, in uh, uh, Alaska. And she donated twice and then found out that she has like this uh, disformity and she lost the ability to have uh, children naturally herself. And she went back and asked, where did these eggs go? Are there any left? Can I use some to have my own children? And they said, no, they wouldn't give her any information. They wouldn't tell her about the families, wouldn't tell her if she had any live births. And that's unfair because we live in the day and age where DNA tests, for example, We can take a simple DNA test, measure our blood, and know exactly who our genetic parents are. So why would you not share that information with with an egg donor? 
Exactly. I think there's a lot of legislation that needs to be still put in place to be advocating for the egg donor's rights. I think that the recipients are very protected, but I think there are big gaps in the contract for the egg donor. Like things like this, should the egg donor ever find out that she has a gen- genetic condition or an issue where she cannot reproduce, there should be a clause that states that she has the right to appeal to have information about if there are any remaining embryos. Because those families may have completed their families and be happy to donate them back to her. Exactly. Because I have two of, I have two of my families, one that lives in California in Sacramento. Um, the, the, the donor baby knows me and she calls me Auntie oh. Jen. Uh, I've met her. Uh, and they have seven embryos stored in India. And they've said to me, we're done having our family. If you ever need them, they're yours. Wow. So that's, that's incredible. The kind of open-minded, and open-minded and transparency we need between, you know, egg donations and recipients. And this is why I'm for open donations. Yeah. Because it allows the two families to establish a relationship. But one of the main reasons why American agencies are against that is, is because should the family want a sibling project, they lose out on the profit of right. organizing it again. And so they can see that. I feel like there's a I lot of women that are keeping the fact that they are donors secret because they don't want anyone to know that they couldn't have their own biological child where it's not that way with sperm donation ironically where we'll use donor sperm no problem and it's just assumed that you know the husband is the dad um even if the family knows it's not they may not tell their children this and so it's a really huge debate how do you bring up a child like luckily in your case the egg donor family told their child that you exist i mean i don't know how you probably felt uh, it sounds like you have uh very strong opinions you wanted to know who were the children that were created yeah i mean actually four of my three of my four donations are all known um there there were three of them were independent i found the families sort of via forums um i've donated in brisbane malaysia india uh, and i've been to india a few times um so for me, I have got some of them on Facebook, so I can just see photos whenever I want, which is pretty cool, but then we don't actually have to interact often. We can just sort of check in and see how everyone's doing. And, you know, I have that WhatsApp is such a great tool because you can send a message and just sort of stay in contact and it's very non-invasive. And then, you know, the one family in New York, which interesting for me, it's a gay couple. Um, I, by error, received their information from the clinic in, in, in India, um, so I got their two names, and I sort of found them up on Facebook, and I just sent them a very polite email, because I, I thought, you know, being that there were two gay dads, that they would be open to uh, potentially having contact, uh, but they, and they never responded, so I, you know, I didn't try again, but, you know, I think it is, we're one genetic swab away from knowing where everybody is in the world, so... Yeah. I know it's we don't really have that, that that belief that there is anonymity is, is actually very false. We don't so have true. that anymore. Right, right, and we didn't think about that when uh, IVF was pioneered back forty plus years ago. So things no. have definitely changed with technology. So let's dive into a little bit about like what do you want? Where do you see your future going? Here you did this amazing thing and you donated to to help other couples, but what do you think about your own family? Well, I've been single for four years now. Um, it's just really difficult to find anybody that kind of fits in with my lifestyle. Girlfriend, you're and preaching to the choir I'm here. not afraid of a strong, independent woman. Me too. <laughs> you know, so I kind of also, I'm kind of over repeating my life story again and again and again and again. I'm like, I'll well, now you can just cats. send them to this video online and be like, hey, here's my story if you want to know more about me. Exactly. If you want to date me, just send the car. I'll be ready. Jokes. <laughs> but no, so, yeah, so I kind of always knew that I was going to freeze my eggs at some point. It was something, it's the right thing to do. I don't really have that, like, maternal biological clock ticking inside and going, oh, my God, I want a baby. It's, like, way down on my to-do I hear that people change though, when they meet the right person that they want to be their parenting partner, that everything clicks and all of a sudden, you're like, I want a baby. So I actually echo that. I don't know that I want a child. I mean, I think I do, but I just don't want the options to be taken away from me. 
Exactly. Like, I want to be able to say that if I want to do it on my own in seven years' time and still hopefully not find myself single at 35, I would probably be like, you know what, stuff it. I'll do it alone. I'll be doing it alone so, so far. So, you know, you don't need to have a partner. But obviously, in the ideal world, nobody wants to raise a child on their own, technically. Um, so I decided that I'd have to freeze in South Africa because mm. it's generally my base, uh, even though I travel a lot. And So you're going I through was- cycle right now? Yeah, so tomorrow I'm supposed to be starting medication. I got... Yay! You got your men up here. <laughs> yeah. So excited for that. Awesome. Um, so I'm hoping that... Because I've got 15 good follicles, so that's a good indication that we should get at least 10 to 12 mature eggs. Because uh, that's been my average over the, the years when I was an egg donor. Um, the nurse practitioner is going to be giving me my treatment plan tomorrow in person and then we'll see what happens so it sounded like you had a little bit we were had going through this text exchange it sounded like you had a little bit of rocky start a hiccup yeah so because i was i saw my fertility specialist in may and i kind of like said to him well this is my plan i'm about to go overseas for like two and a half months but when i'm back uh, i'm probably be home for about six weeks so that's the only time i have to do this because Around about end of September, I'm off again for like another two months. And nobody wants to be freezing their eggs over Christmas and New Year's. No. So December is completely out for me. It's bikini season. I don't feel like bruises and bloat. No, thank you. So it was winter or, and I didn't want to wait till next year because right now I'm 29. Next year I'm 29 and a half. And like, I kind of want to do it on the other side of 30. Yeah. Every half year matters. (laughs) Exactly. So um, he said he did a scan, and in May there was about seven, eight with a, a dominant follicle, which is fine. It's you know it's fine. It's um, and he said, well, when you're ready, let us know when your day one is, and we'll plan your cycle. Wow. So just happened to be my luck that he's out of town until Monday. Oh. So I phoned on the, this week Monday, and I let them know. I was like, hi, it's my day one. Um, Please send me what I need, any invoices, deposits. Let's get this going because kind of got to start in two days. And it just took, a, I don't know, maybe someone miscommunication. They had lots of meetings. I'm not blaming anyone. But, you know, when you're in the moment and you and you know as much as we do, if I'd never been through IVF, I probably would have been a lot more chilled because I don't know, I wouldn't have understood the urgency of starting your meds within the first four days. But because I do, and I've done like over 500 stem cycles for other people and plan them, I'm like, I need to hear from somebody now. I am echoing everything you're saying. Like, you are like my clone twin. This is what I do too. And so then like, you just know better and you're like, wow, I need everything to fall into place. And just yeah. to... Um, emphasize with you or, or sympathize with you um, our stim cycle that I just well I'm on um, meds tonight for day two and yesterday was a crapshoot it was like do we start do we not start is it day one for us or no like can, we could wait one more day but then it would change our retrieval date and our doctor is leaving at the end of the month so like once again everything has to happen in that really short window and it's stressful It is stressful. Like I have like so many goals and new things that I've been planning. Like you saw my post yesterday about the things I want to achieve on top of running an international egg donor agency and having independent parents need my attention and egg donors. I then like, I had to like advocate for myself and phone my clinic like four times today. I'm not blaming them. I'm just saying that given how much we have to deal with as women, single women. Yeah. When, when the receptionist is like, but honey, we can just do it next month. I just like. No, that's not I, what we I, planned I, I, I for. Can't. I right. Can't next I month might not be in the emotional state ready for next month. <laughs> but that, that's also something you have to think about. Like I had to mentally prepare myself the entire year. Yep. that I'm going to be jabbing myself with needles again. I know. I know. Like, it's, it's, I've spoken to a woman who frozen their eggs because they are like, oh my God, I want babies. They're like so keen to do it. I'm like. I don't know if I want a baby and I want, I, you know, it's like, Oh, do I really have to do this again? I know. So I, I'm like on cycle number three and I'm like, okay, you can do it, Valerie. You can do it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, when I was younger, like five, four years ago, my last stem cycle and when I did a sibling project in Australia, um, 
I retrieved 11 mature eggs. They got six day five blasts and they got a baby first time. So my eggs worked perfectly fine. Yeah. But um, and, and I didn't feel any emotions or anything. I was like, I was like, this is still easy. And then fast forward till 2018, I did a cycle um, with a clinic in Mexico. The doctor and I didn't get along, but the medical director, the fertility specialist is different to the medical director. He, he was American. Him and I got on really well. Um, but, you know, then the dose I was on was like 450, which is apparently, the, the, you know, what I've read now, the maximum recommended dose is actually 300 IU because the rest of your body just is expensive urine. Um, and there I had a couple of meltdowns because, as you can imagine, on that kind of medication, like anything set me off. And that was the first time that I really experienced being that hormonal and feeling completely out of control with my body. And I was like, this is not me. I'm a calm, cool, collected kind of girl. This is like, this is wild. Yeah. So, um, so I learned from that. And then, you know, we, I did triggered with HCG again, and we got eight eggs, only six mature because the cycle wasn't planned properly and the medication wasn't like in sync. And so half the follicles got mature and the others didn't. Um, and then I got mild OHS. Oh no. So it really wasn't like fun. So I had to be, I was an outpatient for two days going in for three liters of IV and LASIK and all that other stuff. And it actually took, I looked six months pregnant for about three weeks. So that was fun. Um, don't recommend that, but you know, it's manageable, but then also for a woman like us who still don't have that dis- burning desire for a child, when you're sitting with OHS and you can't really breathe and eat, you're like, why am I doing this? I know. I know. I totally, I totally know. Girl, I am right there with you. And I'm sure there's other women that are watching this that are, can, can relate. And so thank you so much for just being so open, like with your story and, and being an open book, because this is how we, when we're honest like this, this is how we're able to say, here's the pros and cons here. We're not sugarcoating it. This is what you can expect. So everybody has a very realistic point of view of what's happening. Yes. Yeah. The thing is, you know, I'm, I'm sort of feeling like here I am in Cape town and I'm 29 and I'm sort of looking around and I'm posting and there's no chatter. There's no one for me to talk to. Like my, my friends don't quite get it because they're just not interested or they think their fertility is going to last forever. Whereas I'm like, no, it's not. Mm-hmm. Um, and also it, it's actually quite cost prohibitive in South Africa. I'm lucky because I've created my own business. So I also saved for it at the same time. And that's something I'm also starting to sort of change. And I'm wanting to create programs which, which, which make it more accessible for more women within South Africa to freeze their eggs. Because I made a post this year on my Facebook and I said to a woman, you know, if you could get half your egg freezing for free, but it resulted in you donating half the eggs to somebody, would you ladies do it? And like 30 people replied and said, absolutely. Yeah. So that means that that is that means in South Africa, women, career women are prepared to help people by not by being egg donors, but if they would donate half, if they were getting half. Mm-hmm. So that was their motivation. Yeah. So that's a project that I'm really interested on, like developing at the moment. I love because, it. I love it because know, that's one of my pillars too. Is I want to help access to care because you know this technology is so amazing, but if nobody uses it, then it's a wasted yeah. technology, and we live in the time and day and age when we can really impact our future, why not? Exactly, and the the thing is, what I don't understand is, we have all the information to prevent social infertility. There is no reason women my age and below should suffer unless it's genetic related. Um, You know, education should be happening in high school. When you're 16 in bio class, you should be learning that your eggs start to become fried after 35 yeah you should that we, we teach about preventative pregnancies but we don't teach about taking ownership over your reproductive future yeah like, and sexual health like people are getting stds and it's an infertility cause you know and they don't even know that one in three sexual experiences could equal an std 
Well, that's what I told my friends. Do you realize that with the average person, even in South Africa, one in three has chlamydia? And I said, for a woman that is like a fertility threatening because it causes scarring if it's left untreated. And people like look at me with these question marks on their faces. I'm like, why don't you know this stuff? It's mm-hmm. like, don't you go to your gynae once a year? I'm like, I've never been to a gynecologist. I'm like, what? Well, You're and most, in the in the states, only gynecologists only spend an average of twelve minutes with their patients once a year. And now they've changed the rules that you only need a pap smear every three years. So if they're only seeing their doctor once every three years, twelve minutes is not enough time. No, it's not. I mean, here in South Africa, the recommended is once a year for an annual physical checkup and a pap smear, which I think is good. But I still think you can, if you have twelve minutes a year with your patient when she's 28 29 those 12 minutes should include 30 seconds saying hey we're going to do an amh test and we're going to scan to your afc next cycle right and see make sure and see where you are fertility wise and have a baseline and then that patient can make an informed decision about her reproductive options girl high five you are my soulmate <laughs> from another i mean it's it's, it's so another country because I sit here and I'm like, I was at a barbecue last week, Friday, and this one woman was like 34. And she's like, oh, oh, my husband and I have been trying for four months uh, to have, like, you know, we haven't fallen pregnant. I was like, have you been to gynae? Have you asked these questions? Has he sent you any blood work? She's like, no. I was like, he's 34 and he's not done anything to even find out what your fertility is. He's like, she's like, yeah, I had a kid when I was like 20 something. I said, yeah, that was like almost 10 years ago. Come on. Yep. I'm, not, I'm not mad at her, but I'm mad well, at the, the celebrity, industry. The celebrities down. don't help either because, you know, they're having kids at 50 and they're using donor eggs and no one's talking about it. It's just yeah. all there is to it. And so then I people mean, see that and they think they can get pregnant at 50. And that's just not possible. No, it's really, really not. I mean, like I see these stories like Janet Jackson. I was like, please, that's donor egg. Yeah. Unless unless she like did secret egg freezing when she was thirty and told nobody about it, we can't then we can't pass comment. But if she didn't, it's a egg donor. It's humanly impossible to almost use produce your an own egg eggs. at that age. Use your own eggs at fifty. And I think w- the difference is is that we can still get pregnant in our late forties, just not with our DNA unless you froze. And that's the key yeah. message. Yeah, that, that, that is the message that is being misplaced, unfortunately. And I think the two things that need to really change is the education that's being filtered down to the youth and the transparency of people who are in the limelight, to be honest. Yep. That they are actually using donor eggs or donor sperm because they're creating this misconception that fertility lasts forever. Yep. Well, <laughs> this has been an awesome chat. I am a big fan of yours. Thank you so much for telling your story and we will keep up with you online. I'll do that. Thank you so much and we'll chat soon. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye.